Hi, my name is Carl Fisher, and I'm going to be talking to you today about anions and cation analysis of produced water in hydraulic fracturing using ion chromatography. There are several challenges in looking at hydraulic fracturing and the, the products of it. There's the potential for contamination of water, soil, and air, and also there's compliance monitoring that one needs to be aware of, particularly if one is, is the driller. So there are factors that impact the local environment, but also there are considerations that the people who are actually drilling have to take into account. So one of them, as I've mentioned, is compliance with uh, shale, water, shale gas regulations, the Clean Water Act, uh, optimization for the fracturing process itself. So these, these are factors that the drillers are going to have to consider. So these are a number of challenges and there are several solutions. And I'm going to be focusing today on water, water quality monitoring, looking at anions, cations, but there's also other things such as metals, organics, and radiation. So I wanted to go over with you the hydraulic fracturing workflow. So as, you, as you can see, there are a number of places that one would typically want to monitor. You can see in the lower part uh, where it says monitoring well, but at the initial part, you're going to want to do a pre-injection site, site assessment. So that's going to take in, into consideration a lot of this monitoring, monitoring that you've already done. So you're going to start with fresh water and then fracking chemicals. So the fracking chemicals consist of a number of additives. So typically they're going to be some things like um, things that lubricate the solutions or surfactants, uh, scale inhibitors. You're also going to be having uh, sand in there. So there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be part of this mixture. And so it's fairly complex. And so the mixture itself is going to have to be tweaked depending on the composition of the fresh water itself. So typically it's going to be really clean and pristine. So that is used for the first well. So you can see well one there. And then so a fracturing event occurs, you get gas or oil production, and then you have waste that's generated from that. So you're going to have water coming up. So typically you're going to have flow back or produce water. And then the question becomes, what do you do with that? So that's something that can be quite expensive to dispose of. One of the ways in which this is done is by deep well injection. The other one, and this is something that is being done more and more frequently, is the water is recycled. So it needs to be desalinated, and as you can see here, there's water going, and then you have a brine, which, which is actually much easier to dispose of than all of this volume of water. So you get recycled water, and with that, you can use it for another fracturing event. So you would, at that point, you, it's really important, I think, even more so than initially, to know what the composition is of that water. Because the fracturing mix, it can be very susceptible to the precise constituents of that water. So this is another point at which monitoring would be really critical. Here are uh, a number of places at which you could be doing monitoring. You can see that there's site monitoring. You can, you can look at sediments, brines, flowback, and also produce water, of, as, I've, as I've already mentioned. The flowback is actually composed primarily of the fracturing fluid itself. So that's the first stuff that's going to be coming back out of the ground once the pressure is released. Produced water actually accumulates once the, uh, the well starts producing, so you're going to be any gas and oil. So then it's referred to as produced water. On the right hand side there, at the, the upper right, you see it says HF, so that's hydraulic fracturing. And it's the water and its composition and designing the whole fracking process. And this is based primarily on the constituents, on the, on the components of that water. You can see on the left hand side here, there are a number of anal analytes, uh, parameters that are measured. You have inorganic ones, such as metals, cations, isotope ratios, anions, and then organic ones, such as surfactants, natural gas, and then radiation and water chemistry. I'm not going to be talking about all of these things, but I'm going to be focusing on the things that IC does really well. And I've, I've uh, indicated them there. So there's cations, anions, and organic acids. If you want to get a comprehensive picture of the whole uh, fracking, uh, all, all of the byproducts of fracking, then you would need multiple instruments. But today, as I said, I'm just going to be focusing on IC. Here are some of the analytes that one would want to look at when you're, when you're analyzing your, your waste products. I start off with the inorganic anions, uh, starting with chloride. And as, as you can see here, it, it actually does imp have a, a pronounced impact on the effectiveness of additives. So if you notice that this is quite high, you're going to want to reduce it, or you're going to have to adjust the additives that, you're, that you have in your fracturing fluid to compensate for that. It can also disrupt the nitrification process. 
And this is something that happens downstream if the water is being treated perhaps for discharge to surface water and perhaps even for drinking water. So this is a consideration that you want to keep in mind. Bromide is another one because uh, during the, the treatment water process, so it's a purification using ozonation, for instance, you get a lot of disinfection byproducts formed, and bromate is one of them. And this is a carcinogen, and that's something that you really don't want to be having in your water. So you want to make sure that you're able to monitor this and so you're not going to be discharging too much bromide, because that could be a concern downstream. There's also sulfate, and that can disrupt the anaerobic digestion process. Once again, this is for water treatment downstream. Organic acids, things like formic and, and acetic acid, these can modulate the pH. And this is, this is a really important consideration for efficient fracking. So on to cations. So there's several cations, uh, potassium, sodium. These, once again, can impact the effectiveness of additives. Lithium, it's, it's toxic to humans. Ammonium, it's corrosive. And there are a number of things that can form scale, such as magnesium, calcium, barium, and strontium. And the reason this is important is because if you have scale forming, you're going to get occlusion of the, the pipe that's, that's transporting the liquids. And also these fractures that you've created, you're going to be occluding those. So you're, you're going to make those smaller. And the recovery of the oil and gas is going to be much, much less than you would like. So there are a number of, cha I mentioned challenges at the beginning, but those are more environmental or driller challenges. These are challenges for IC that I have uh, presented in front of you here. So high concentrations of dissolved salts, which are typical for wastewaters, you can see that a number of the factors that are consideration or you're exceeding the column capacity. And, and this, will, this will give you poor chromatography, as I've indicated here. You can see the red chromatogram on the right-hand side where it says undiluted. It goes up to about 1,200, uh, 1200 microsiemens, and, and you can see the chromatography itself is not very good. You've got peaks that are not symmetrical, and that's not something you want to see. So if you see this, you need that you're going to have to dilute your sample. You're going to have to rerun it. So as I've indicated, you're going to get inaccurate reporting. Below that, you can see that I'm talking about another thing that you can have. So you, can, you can exceed your linear calibration range. So even though you're not overloading your column, you may be exceeding the linear calibration range. And this is analyte specific. And once again, this can, this can lead to inaccurate results and inaccurate reporting. The other thing is that you can decrease your column lifetime. And this is something that you really don't want to do because you, you'd like your columns to last as long as they possibly can. So you don't want to overload it. So there are a number of, of strategies to uh, take care of this challenge. You can uh, do a number of manual analyses. So you can do something post-run. You can determine the, uh, con the concentration based on uh, the chromatography itself. So you can look at your chromatogram, similar to what I showed you in the previous slide. And if you see that the area exceeds the limit that, that you've established based on past experience, then you can rerun that sample. You can also do a pre-run. You can do something like a manual conductivity measurement. If it exceeds, once again, the limit, then you can dilute it and rerun it. These are both somewhat tedious, and the dilutions and the manipulations you do may be prone to errors. So there are, there are actually ways to automate this. There's auto dilution, and this is a feature of, of our Chromelian Chromatography Data System software. It's a post-run analysis that looks at the, either the peak height or the peak area. And based on a cutout that you've specified in the software, it's going to determine whether or not the sample needs to be rerun or whether that sample is fine to go ahead with. The other, the other way of doing it is using inline conductivity. And what this does is it measures the conductivity inline prior to loading your sample onto the column. And once again, if, if, you've, if it exceeds a particular cutoff that you've established, then it'll load less sample. So how does one load less sample? Well, you can either inject less sample by using a smaller sample loop, a partial loop injection, or doing an automated sample dilution. And in this way, you're going to lower the amount of sample that you're loading onto the column. And here I just wanted to show you a little bit of, uh, little bit of statistics for the automated dilution itself. On the top, you see conductivity. And this just shows you the precision. You can see the percentage RSD, which is really tight. And this is from five different injections. Down below, you see the RSDs for different draw dispense. So you've got set volumes, liquid dispense, liquid dispense. So I measured that. And based on those numbers, I was able to get the RSD values and also determine the accuracy. So you can see it's pretty close to 99%. So this is a really effective strategy for automatically diluting your samples. All right, on to the data. So here I have the anions, and as it says at the top, determination of anions in produced water. 
one of the things I want to point out is that this uses a 2 millimeter inside diameter, and the flow rate is 0.25 mils per minute. So as you can see in, the, in this slide here, so we're looking at anions and produced water. So A is actually our standard, as you can see on the right-hand side there. Uh, we have B, C, and D. And I guess I, at this point, I, I should say that the produced waters were obtained from Texas, California, and North Dakota. And I had to do various dilutions based on the, the, the concentration of anions present. You can see that chloride is a dominant anion here. And you can see that it's quite high. It's, it's head and shoulders above all of the other anions that are present. But you've also got a little bit of sulfate, a little bit of bromide. You can actually see it a little bit more easily by looking at it as a bar graph. You can see that, as I said, chloride is quite high. We have North Dakota, which is really high, about 180,000. If you go over to the other, the other part of the, this, this figure, you can see the bromide is, is comparable, uh, at least for the Marcellus. So I should point out that the, the Marcellus FB here is actually flowback. So I've included, just for comparison purposes, not only produce water, but flowback. And this flowback is uh, the fraction 10, which is the highest concentration. So from the flowback that I had, I started with the first barrel, and so that's my first aliquot, and the tenth is actually the 100,000th barrel collected. So it's the most concentrated as far as ions is concerned. So I thought that would be a good comparison to, to put here. And as you can see, you can see that Marcellus, as far as bromide and as far as chloride, it's kind of comparable, but the other ones, the Texas and California, are considerably lower than North Dakota. And for the formate, for the acetate, the organic acids, they're relatively low. So there's quite a bit of variability. And most of this variability appears to be due to the location from which these samples were obtained. So what about cations? Well, here I'm showing a, actually a capillary setup. So you can see it's 0.5 millimeter inside diameter. And the flow rate is actually quite slow. It's 10 microliters per minute. And what this does is, is it allows you to leave a system on all the time. And that's a really nice feature of a, a capillary system. You can actually leave it, go away, run your samples, come back the next day, and you don't have to worry about this prolonged startup period. So that's a really nice feature of capillary. So you, as you can see, there, there's once again, there's one cation that dominates. So there's one ion that, that's, that's the dominant ion, but it looks like there's something else that's a little bit less, but still significant. And once again, I have Texas, California, and North Dakota, all of which I had to do dilutions on. So here we can see what they are we can see that that major peak, that peak number two, is actually sodium. So there's quite a bit of sodium. And then the, uh, the sixth peak is calcium. And then there's, there's some other things there, as you can see. See, once again, North Dakota, it looks like it has the most of any of the samples there. So here we go when we're looking at it as a bar graph and comparing them once again to the Marcellus shell flowback. You can see that calcium for North Dakota and the Marcellus, they're kind of comparable. Sodium, it's once again the highest in North Dakota. And then you've got potassium, ammonium, that's really high in North Dakota compared to the others. And then magnesium, strontium, very little. Actually, there's no barium. And then there's lithium. So some of the information that, that you can get from looking at this is information that will help you guide the treatment and the reuse strategy. The other thing I wanted to point out here was that depending on where these samples are taken, you can, you can see that there's quite a, quite a lot of variability. And the take-home message that one would want from that is that even though you, you've collected data at one site, you can't really directly apply it to another. So it has to be really, really site-specific. And even within the same shale play, this can be something where there's also additional variability. So you actually want to do this at each specific well in order to get the most information out of each site and each event and each analysis. So to conclude, just to wrap up, I've shown you that wastewater, it contains a lot of salt. You can actually overcome this challenge of high salt by automating it. You can do it manually, but you can also automate it. You can have pre-screening and dilution, and in this way you can get accurate, consistent results for anions, organic acids, and cations. And then this can help you formulate a wastewater strategy and reuse policy. I just want to point out that there are a number of technical notes available if you want to get more details. Uh, technical note 138 talks a lot about this automated dilution using the ASAP auto sampler. Uh, 139, technical note 139, it looks at fracking flowback. And then the produced water look is, is application note 1105. And it is the most recent one there that we have produced. And uh, as far as cations, I didn't quite get that one, but it's the fracturing flowback is looked at in application note 1094.
And also, if you want to get additional information about all of our IC innovations, you can go to thermoscientific.com slash IC for more details. Before I finish, this is my very last slide. I just want to point out the instruments that I used. I used an ICS2100. It's an RFIC, so it's a reagent-free IC system. And that was for the 2 millimeter. For the capillary side, you can either use the ICS4000 or you can use the ICS5000 Plus, which is what I used. And you can see on top of that, you can see something that has a little bit of an opening. That's the ASAP auto sampler. And that can be fitted with the pH conductivity module, which fits right up underneath that little hood that's there. So that's a, that's a nice accessory that you can use for any of these systems that, that, that I've indicated here. But the ICS5000 Plus, it has multiple capabilities. You can have a couple of different pumps, and you can either have analytical or capillary systems set up. And with that, I would like to conclude, and thank you for your attention.